Aloha, everybody. Good morning. Hey, welcome, welcome. How's it, Cyrus? Good morning. Good morning, all of you here and everybody beginning to log on on Facebook. Such a blessed day. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, those greeters getting wind blown out there. You know? oh, so nice. So looking forward to my brother, friend, Pastor Mike's message. So, so good. But, hey, since brother TJ's here, I ask him, hey, TJ, remember TJ? Hey, come, show face. Yeah. All right. Hey, Hi, wait. Stand your distance, huh? Make your distance. Six feet. Six feet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, how's it going? Huh? Good. How's everything with you, Pastor? Wow, that's you a loaded busy. question. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? No, everything is good. Family is good. Um, you know, it's with with things going on nowadays. It's good. I mean, we're we're trending on the right way with in terms of COVID. We're actually going to go back November twenty. First. November 21st, right? yeah, we're going to have one service, yeah. our Thanksgiving service, yes, yes. yes. and so I think pray. one more time after that, pray. so pray for us, pray for Midpack that, you know, things continue to kind of go the way that we, you know, we foresee it going, God foresees it going, um, and I found a scripture that I thought was proper, you know, for the present time. Um, and it's from Joshua 1 9 it says have I not commanded you be strong and courageous yes. do not be frightened and do not be dismayed it's good for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go mm. so I mean yeah. those of us who are on trips um, like I know Lori is in Vegas right now um, for a conference uh, we have I heard we have a couple new people joining us today for service so you know just just be courageous and know that the Lord is protecting us wherever Amen. we walk, wherever yeah. we're going. And, you know, something like COVID won't stop us. Yeah. You know, yeah. we can worship wherever, wherever He wants us to. Amen. Yeah. Oh, brother, that's a good word. Hey, just say a prayer as we're oh. beginning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's all about it. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord uh, for this wonderful but windy day. Um, we know that when the wind blows, it's your breath upon our um, faces um, to keep us cool but also to just let us know that you're there yes um, we pray for those who are still on their way to attend service those who are online uh, in the comfort of home you know we pray a blessing and protection over them um, we pray for mid pack um, and our service coming up in November and we pray over our pastors who lead our church every Sunday and every day after that, we say these things in your name. Amen. 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 Oh, good. Come, let us worship the King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love
I trust you, Lord. Sing, I give you all my heart. I give you all my heart, Lord. Right now, I give you all my heart, Lord. Take my life, Lord. I give you all my heart, Lord. Give it to you, Lord. I give you all my heart, Lord. Thank you, God, for um, just allowing us the freedom to be able to just come before you. I mean, just thank you for just a, just a little tent and being able to just worship together, come together as people of God. And, and thank you for those that are joining in. Um, and Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit, just where we're at here, those that are tuning in live, that your Holy Spirit would just be alive in in every life in every situation lord speak to us as we open our hearts to your living and awesome word god your written word that would be broken lord uh breaking the the bread of life lord so thank you for our brother mike we just thank you so much for giving us ears to hear and lord help us just to be present help us to be present in soul in mind and Lord, as you're speaking to us individually, Lord, uh, give us thoughts, give us images, give us uh, words, uh, give us truths, Lord. We need you. Just right now, just uh, in, in your heart and those online, those here, let's just give him our hearts and uh, in the spirit of repentance, humility, uh, just in honor, you know, that fear of the Lord, God, we... We want to reverence you more. And uh, as our brother Thomas encouraged us earlier, um, in spite and despite of everything going on, our responses of our hearts are not dictated by circumstances. We don't want it to be. So just go ahead and give him your heart. Just tell him you love him. Love Lord, God. we thank you. Ask for forgiveness where forgiveness is needed help call on him we call on you for strength strength to endure uh, there's certain I mean all kinds of situations Lord represented whether it's relational with kids with grandkids with uh, co-workers uh, family and marriages and uh, in communities Lord we just ask God your Holy Spirit to be present would teach us comfort us console and counsel us into freedom Oh, it's yes. a good word. Holy Spirit, yes. counsel us into freedom. Yes. We thank you, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Amen. Woo! Yes. Oh, I don't, I don't like to say, I mean, you know, it's like, well, that was a good prayer, man. Woo! Oh, I needed that. <laughs> Lord, you know, you're just bearing your heart before the Lord, so it's so good. Oh, it's good to raise a, a praise the Lord, yeah, despite uh, circumstances. And Lord, we choose to raise that hallelujah, so wow, so good. Well, give someone a, a fist pump, high five. If you live with them or like them, you can hug them, oh, yeah, Take your mask, however that works. And uh, before Ma uh, Pastor uh, Mike comes, uh, let's, let's take a look at this. Ooh.
Thank you, Jerry. Let's pray. Let's pray. Yes. And those of you who know Kule, uh, she's doing well. Let's pray for her. And then others, let's, let's lift up those on our hearts. God, we believe, hears our hearts. Those we're praying for, the names coming to heart. So let's, Lord, we thank you as we continue uh, to pray for uh, Kule, for the family, um, for uh, David, Chad, Blaine. Thank you for just bringing the family together. Oh, Alan. You're there. <laughs> You're well. You're alive. Lord, death can be such and is. It's a good thing in Christ. Lord, so thank you, uh, Lord, for receiving Alan. But comfort Kule, Lord. We mourn with her. We, we just we grieve with her, but we also worship with her, Lord. We thank you. And we lift up all those that uh, just on our prayer list, on our hearts, Lord, um, just Lift up all of those who are fighting health issues that's on our prayer list and bless the Tomitas and O'Haras and bless uh, our, our sister Joanne and our brother Harris. And I, I pray just you bless, uh, yeah, just all the, all the names, Lord, is coming to our hearts. Go ahead and just lift them up right now. Those on Facebook tuning in, just take this time, just lift up those names. And, and Lord, I know these names are just rapid fire going to you, but we thank you care, Lord. You, you care, care so we thank you, we and uh, we love you, care. Lord. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We open our hearts to you, and uh, and to your word. Thank you for my brother Mike. Thank you just for his life. Just cover he and Wendy, their family, and uh, hear their hearts cry for their family as well. But we receive your word, God, through our brother, and uh, and so we pray for just a heart change for us, some minds, some different changes, the way maybe we're thinking, the way that we're living, but we thank you for your great grace. In the name of Jesus, we say, amen, amen. Oh, so good. Before he comes, real quick, and I just want to highlight, we mentioned earlier in uh, service, if you didn't catch it online especially, that uh, we're going to be meeting back at Midpack one time in November on the 21st for a Thanksgiving service. So it's not signed yet, but I, I think it's going to go through, but we'll give more information. So just mark that particular Sunday. So we'll meet that one time, and then we'll continue this here as well. And then we're looking to meet once, maybe twice in December. So again, just seeing how things go, trying to be led of the Lord that way. So, uh, But let's welcome our brother, Brother Mike. Hey, where are you going to stand, brother? Oh, this side. Okay, all right. We let you do that. That way I can see everybody except for Thiago. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Good morning. Aloha. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Nice to see everybody's smiling faces. One of the benefits of being up here and speaking is I don't have to wear my mask. <laughs> oh, hard time to breathe with this. For everybody on uh, Facebook Live, good morning. God bless you. We miss seeing your beautiful smiling faces, but thank you for joining us here this morning. A couple of weeks ago, I shared on you, all of you being diamonds in the rough. You remember that? Yes. And, and many of you left here feeling, wow, that's great, man. I'm a diamond in the rough. Feeling, you know, this is awesome. This is great. So this morning, we're going to talk about the flip side of being a diamond in the rough, and that is God's deeper work and process in us, which comes through actually being thrown into the crucible. Everybody know what a crucible is? A crucible is an amazing thing because it's, it's made with materials that do not melt under intense heat. 
But the crucible is for putting metals inside and putting intense heat on the metal so that the metal will melt, but the crucible won't melt. And it's for the purpose of, of purifying the metal as well as it making it moldable and shapeable so that metal, that hot molten metal, can be poured into a cast and it, and it will cure and cool in the cast. So figuratively, these figuratively speaking in the sense of that word crucible a crucible is a severe test or trial or an extremely challenging experience <laughs> how many of you have been in the crucible this week or this last year or whatever that period of time you you feel like hey i'm in the crucible and i don't understand what's going on but it's getting pretty hot the heat is on and so I want to just have, have a word of prayer. We're going to look at the Word of God. We're going to break down the Word of God. But more than anything else, I, I want to say this, is that the message that I'm sharing this morning is not designed for, you know, I didn't get these thoughts thinking about any of you. It's not like, oh, I'm going to preach and I'm going to aim my message toward Todd, you know. It, that wasn't it. But when the that's the rod. That's good to hear. Thank you. So if anything that I say hits you, it's like the Holy Spirit using buckshot. So when he, you know, when the Holy Spirit's doing it, it's like spraying you. It's like, all right. So it's not specifically. I'm not saying anything specifically for anybody. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through His Word and touching, just having some touch points in each and every one of us. So let's pray. Thank you, God. Lord, we just want to declare our love for you. We love you. We appreciate you. Yeshua, we are so grateful for the salvation that you bring to us. And Holy Spirit of God, we just thank you that you are our comforter. You are the one that comes alongside to strengthen, to encourage, to comfort. And Holy Spirit, we're just so grateful for your presence here this morning. And Lord, we just ask that you just would begin to mold our hearts and begin to speak to us from the Word of God as we read it. And Lord, that truly, even as Pastor Rod was praying, Lord, that we would be shapeable, moldable, yes. that we would be uh, tender at heart to hear your voice and not leave here the same as we came in, but really to have a touch of you in our lives. And so we ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Now, as far as the crucible is concerned, I want you to remember that figurative definition of the crucible as we look through the passages of Scripture this morning. Because there are experiences that we go through in life, those experiences that you've been through this week. You know, we think about Kuule and her husband passing. You know, these are, these are difficult situations that we go through. But I want to encourage you that these specific experiences that you go through when you feel like you're in the fire you're in the crucible that they're designed to bring you to a place in your life where you're actually moldable in the hands of God moldable in the hands of God God wants to put us in that place where we are like he can shape us and form us and the direction that he's shaping us and forming us is actually to be more like him Okay, so as we look at this passage of scripture, Peter is speaking to a church, the church abroad. Okay, he's speaking to Christians that are going through difficult times. And of course, yeah, we all, we all go through difficult times, but these Christians were going through difficult times, not only their personal lives, but also with the government. They were being persecuted by the Roman communities. They were being outcasts. They were suffering some persecution. So... Peter, and Peter's writing from Rome. And so he's in the midst of the fire or the crucible in Rome. And so he begins this, this, these verses, 1 Peter chapter 1. I think it's in your notes right there, so you can just look at your notes. In this you rejoice. Now, I'm, I don't know if I'm reading from the same translation. Maybe I should. <laughs> In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, 
more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when all your when all life is done, it's it's you said it, it's done it. You you know everything you could say, everything you could ever do. That's it. You go to be with the Lord. Everything that you're going through now is for the purpose that there might be honor and praise when Christ comes. Though you have not seen Jesus, you love Him, and though you do not see, though you do not now see him you believe in him and rejoice with great joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls so let's let's break this down I, I really would like to have all of us get the big picture and when I talk about the big picture I'm talking about the big picture in your life okay what is what is really what is God really doing in your life because too often, we're just focused on the microscopic. You know, if you're married or you're with somebody, you know, your children or whatever, and you're with them 24-7 and you're with them all the time, you, sometimes, if you're not careful, you can focus in on the microscopic mm -hmm. rather than having the big picture of the relationship and what God wants to do in it. You understand what I'm saying? It's like microscopic. You know, hey, why are you always going to do that? Why, why don't you... Put the toilet seat down. Why you got to put the toilet paper like that? You know, it's like we have all these idiosyncrasies and we start focusing on the microscopic in each other rather than looking at the big picture. Yeah. Well, God wants us to get the big picture of, of our own lives. What is God doing in us? Right here, it talks a little bit about that. That ultimately, when Christ comes for us at the end of our life, as we enter into eternity, we there's something for us there we have eternal life we're we're going to have resurrected bodies our sins are forgiven we have salvation god's working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure he's got us as diamonds in the rough but he has also put us in the crucible for the for the purifying of our lives to get out the junk so he can put more of himself in us and so the big picture is that one day when you pass from this life you're going to be resurrected unto newness of life that's a living hope. That's the living hope. And we have to keep, keep that in, in, pic, in the picture. It's not just, hey, I'm going through a hard time. There's, we have a living hope. Christ being our hope of salvation and the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And Christ's going to come again. And he's going to receive you unto himself. And so as it says in verses 6 and 7, that there's a, the trials, there's purpose. Trials is for the proving of your faith, the genuineness of your faith. But he tells us to glory in these trials. How many of you uh, like to glory in your trials? Like, really? <laughs> I'm supposed to glory in this? You know, I mean, excuse the language, but it sucks right now. <laughs> I'm supposed to glory in all this hardship? He's saying to glory in it. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I want to tell you this this morning, is that what you're going through in life, the challenges that you're going through, whether it be interpersonal, whether it be relational, whether it be financial, physical, whatever it is, they've come for purpose. And that's the we have to keep an eye on the big picture. We're not just... Uh, you know, that what we're going through is not just so that we can get run through the mill or raked over the coals and, you know, we, we, we end up being, wow, why is this happening to me? This isn't fair. Yeah, life's not fair. Bad things happen to good people. And the age-old question of, of what we read yesterday even from Psalm 73 is that, God, why, do the, why does it seem like the wicked prosper but and the righteous suffer? We, we look at life and we see all these inequities and we're just saying, Lord, how come? Why? But I want to share with you is that what Peter is saying is that these have come so that there may be the proven genuineness of your faith, which is greater worth than gold. Now, there will come a time 
when every hardship you bear while remaining in faith will have a day of reward. Keep an eye on the big picture. And so ultimately when Christ comes for us, I don't want to be in the push the position where I'm looking regrettably at my life and I know there will be some regrets, but I'll be going, wow, Lord, I wish, you know, I just wish that I believed more. I believed in you more. I trusted in you more. Lord, I wish I gave more praise instead of complaining. I just gave more praise. How many of you, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, at the end of our days, at the end of our life, we stand before him and go, man, how come I did that? How come I chose that? How come I chose to not believe you, to trust you? When that day comes and the reality of all the promises of God come to fullness, you will look at this life and all of its hardships for what it really is. And you know what it really is? Preparation for eternity. Yeah? Everything you're going through in this life is like you're a diamond in the rough. Now God says, I'm putting you in the crucible for the purpose of preparing you for eternity. The Christians that Peter was talking to, they suffered from the government. They suffered from communities. Today, you know, we're blessed today. We live in a country where we can actually meet like this. We can actually have it Facebook Live. And we can, talk to, we can talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, our faith. We can pray with one another. We can even say things that we don't agree with that is going on in the world. But in a lot of countries where Christians are suppressed, they can't meet together like this. They can't pray together like this. They cannot definitely say anything opposing whatever the governmental system is in place at that time. These Christians were in that kind of situation and we, uh, we, you know, we need to recognize that, hey, we're blessed. They were going through some tough times. And that's not to say that, you know, if we're comparing what we go through and what they went through, that, you know, there's no comparison. We, our challenges, our trials are just different, right? I mean, when you think about the challenges that we go through, I think about, you know, the passing of a loved one. That's like heavy, you know, the illness of a child. That's heavy. That's hard. You know, failures in your own personal life, interpersonal challenges, relational challenges, they can be very difficult. But the important thing to remember is that whatever the hardship, whatever it is, whatever you're going through right now, whatever the challenge, God has a greater purpose for you in the midst of it. How you walk through that hardship is totally up to you. You can be giving praise and thanksgiving or murmuring and complaining all the way. You can operate in faith with the result of praise and realize that the ultimate purpose of God for that hardship is to produce in you more of Himself. Or you can take another lap around Mount Sinai. How many of you know where Mount Sinai is? Okay, so it's in the Arabian Peninsula and it's a dry, hot place. And you know, when you're taking a, it's a reference to what was going on with the children of Israel. And they had to take 40 years of laps in that desert <laughs> because of this unbelief. They weren't willing to trust God in the midst of their challenges. They were like spoiled children who when they didn't get their way, all they did was grumble and complain. And so I want to go to our first observation. What is, what is our first observation? Your trials have a God purpose. And so I want you to say this. The hardships I'm going through now, God has a purpose in it. Your trials have a God purpose. Whatever they are, your trials have a God purpose. And here are a few of the purposes. Number one, God's purpose is that you might have a deeper understanding of God's love for you. A deeper understanding of God's love for you. Number two, you might have a greater understanding of God's faithfulness to you. 
God, you're faithful. Even in the midst of this trial, you're faithful to me. You haven't walked away from me. You haven't abandoned me. You're right there for me. And number three, the purpose of your, your trial, God's purpose is that you might have a clearer understanding of what is going on inside of you. Now this is huge. This point, we could preach all morning on it. What is God doing inside of you? You know, the, the children of Israel walking around Mount Sinai for 40 years in that peninsula desert. God was trying to work with them. And they just continued in unbelief. They just weren't learning. They weren't getting the message. And so, if you live in a, in a, in a home where there's a little step up from uh, where your door is and where the entry is. You know, the first time you go into that home, you might trip, up, trip on it a few times. You might, you know bump your toe, stub your toe, you know, it's like, it gets annoying, right? Hey, this, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, not again. After a while, you get some things figured out, right? Hey, you know what, maybe I'm going to walk in my house, I'm going to bring that foot up a little higher. But it's, it's funny that pain can teach you a lesson. But some people don't learn. They keep on going or another lap, lap around Mount Sinai and they keep on kicking their toe and kicking their toe and they get real mad at that little step up and curb and they cuss at the curb and, you know, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> when, hey, we have a responsibility in this. Let's just lift that foot up a little higher, be more conscientious about how to make the entry. And so... God's got a purpose, and the, and the purpose is that there's a clearer understanding of what's going inside of us. If you're uncomfortable with what is going on in your life right now, it might just be that God is putting His finger on something in you and going, I want to deal with that. I'm touching it. I'm bringing it out because I want to deal with it. Oh, I don't have a problem with that. Everybody's telling me I have a problem, but I don't have a problem with that. Oh, really? Maybe God is just bringing it to your attention now. You've been living with that for so many years and he's going, enough is enough. I'm going to bring this to light and I'm going to put my finger on it and it's going to get uncomfortable. And so you can keep on fighting. You can keep on being in denial or you can say, okay, God, okay. What are you doing inside of me? What is, what is happening in here? What do you want to heal inside of me? What do you want to bring into alignment with you inside of me? The fourth point of what God, part of what God wants to do in your trials, His purpose, is an opportunity for you to give praise. And also, trust God. You know, it's interesting that whenever God asks us to trust Him, it's usually in a place that we're uncomfortable. I mean, if it's super easy, then it doesn't really take much trust, right? So if I had, if I had Dwayne up here this morning, I said, Dwayne, look that way. I want you to fall back, and I'm going to catch you. <laughs> Dwayne's looking at me and go, bro, you're not strong enough to catch me. <laughs> There's a limited amount of trust, okay? So in... in when, it, when, when God's working in us, there's a purpose. And the part of that purpose is to change our attitude so we can begin to give praise and honor and glory, but also to come into a greater relationship of trust with Him. Do I really trust you? Can I really trust you? We tell ourselves we trust God in everything, but do we really? Like the song we're singing this morning, I'm singing that song and I'm going, Lord, do I really do that? I mean, I like the words of the song. I mean, I really like it. But I'm singing it to you. Do I really do that? Sometimes our biggest struggle in life is just to trust God. You know, we like to, I like to micromanage. I like to man, like when my wife's, my wife's in the kitchen, I go, oh, let me do that for you. Oh, you don't need to, you know, it's like, I could just walk away and go in the other room and let her do her thing. But, you know, I got to be in there going, oh, let me, you know. And we get like that in life. We want to micromanage what God is trying to do in us rather than just going, okay, God, all right, God, I surrender. I'm trusting you. 
I'm really going to trust you and it's not easy. So I want us to watch this video. It's a short video. That's us! I used to pray, Lord, I'll do, I'll, Lord, I'll do anything for you. Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. As long as it's not a third world country. <laughs> We love our conveniences. It's hard to trust God. It's like we might we look at this and we laugh, but it's when you think about it. Wait, God wouldn't ask me to do anything hard, would he? That can't be God. That's just way too hard. The word of God tells us maybe a brother or sister communicates something to us, and we go, Oh, that's not God, that's too hard. God wouldn't, you know, God doesn't want to make it that hard. Hey, giving all and trusting God in everything is challenging. So what is the trust factor? With trust, you, you got to realize that faith and trust are oftentimes used synonymously in, in our language and in the Bible. To trust God is truly to have faith in God and believe that your will is much better for me than my will for me. Your intention for my life is much better for me than even my own intention. Whatever you want to do, God, I know that your love, your faithfulness, and your goodness towards me is your plans are way better than my plans. And though although I may want to do that, you're telling me not to do that. And so here I have the choice. Am I going to trust God? Or am I going to be like the children of Israel, just taking another lap in the desert, complaining constantly like spoiled children because their situation was uncomfortable? Instead of calling on God with praise and, and petition, we're complaining about God. We're complaining to God about our situation not being comfortable. While all along, God wants to use whatever that situation is to pinpoint stuff in us. Hey, Michael. I'm, I'm bringing this to your attention. Yeah, God, how come I still always have this problem? Well, I'm, I'm bringing it to your attention because I want to work it out of you. I don't want you to remain in that. You know, you think about the children of Israel. They got buried in the wilderness. They died in the wilderness. The wilderness represents a life of unbelief. Can you imagine dying in the wilderness, being buried in the wilderness? And yet so many people go through life in the struggle of believing God, they're kind of out there in the wilderness. <clears throat> so I want to get to the application. Application. Get a revelation of the, what the bigger picture of what God is doing in you. Instead of just walking around in the wilderness, get an idea. Say, God, what are you doing in me? And number, the second application is, my, my hardships are preparing me for eternity. It's just preparation. <clears throat> you ever notice that once you give your situations up to the Lord, that you're able to rest in peace, knowing that, okay, God, I gave it to you. I just trust in your goodness. I know I'm not going to have my way, but I'm going to go for your way. So let's move to the next passage of Scripture here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Now concerning <clears throat> this salvation, the prophets... Now he's talking about the salvation of Christ. Not only of the second coming of Christ, but the first coming of Christ. Alright? Yeshua is the name of Jesus, by the way. That's what his mother called him. Hello? <laughs> which means Savior, okay, Savior God, Yeshua. And so, in reference to this Christ coming, first coming, Christ coming, second coming, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied. Now, I want to say this, okay. This scripture is talking about you, it's talking about all of us. Now, think about this. God saw you before the foundation of the world. Verse 2 tells us in this first chapter, through the foreknowledge of God, He saw you. He knew you. 
So concerning this salvation of Christ, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, to be yours, Thomas, to be yours, Becky, to be yours, Tiago, the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring that, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, Margie, but you, Joy, but you, Todd, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long, angels long to look into. When I look at that passage of scripture, my, I come away, my observation is that from the beginning, God's plan of salvation through Christ always had you in mind. Always had you in mind. Once again, God shows us that He has He had us in mind from the foundation of the world. He mentions you in this scripture. The prophets of old were, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they wrote these things concerning Christ before the very time took the time of events took place. It wasn't a series of random events that brought all of these things together. Now I want you to think about your life. It's not a series of random events that are going on in your life. Okay? There's God's purpose. There is purpose. You think about the life of Christ, the time that He entered into the world, during the period that August, I mean, uh, uh, Augustus Caesar called for the tax. Joseph and Mary had to go from where they were living to Bethlehem so that he could be born in Bethlehem according to the prophetic scripture. Then the persecution of Herod going down into Egypt to fulfill that prophetic scripture. Then coming back into Palestine. He wasn't, you know born of Mary by chance. Joseph wasn't his stepfather by chance. It wasn't a series of random events. And at the same time, I want to tell you this this morning, that you weren't born of the parents that you were born of and in the place that you were born just arbitrarily. God had a purpose and design for all of it. You may have been conformed to those things of your family or your family of origin or in the culture that you grew up in. You may have been conformed to those things, but God is in the process of transforming you into the image and likeness of the Son. So however you have been formed or conformed to this world, God is in the process of transforming you. Was it God's plan for all the bad things that ever happened to you in your life? I would say no, not necessarily. But in the, all of those bad things, God has designed grace and healing for, for you. That you no longer have to be captive by those things that have conformed you, that have hurt you, that have damaged you. That God wants to bring His hand in there and He wants to touch you and heal you. It's not His, it's not his purpose and design for you to remain in the hurt, in the bitterness, in the anger, in those experiences that have had such a negative effect on your life. It's not God's purpose for you to stay like that. And so I want to go to our, our application of this second passage of Scripture. And I want you to say that. I want you to say it to yourself. Events of my life are not random they're not random. You know, sometimes I'm on the road and I'm busy. I got to get from point A to point B to point C to point D. Okay? If point A is late, then I might be late for point B. And if point B is late, is early or late, I might be late. So I can find myself, I'm just frantic. I'm on the road. 
And I'm like, ha, ha, ha. So if you see me driving like a madman on the road, <laughs> no, I got to get from point A to point B. Okay? And then, then I'm driving along and I'm going, ha, ha, I got to get there. Oh my gosh, I got 15 minutes. Ha. And then it's like, why do you do this to yourself? You know better. Why do you do this to yourself? And then it's like, okay, wait. Take a breath. Okay, God. I know you know what I'm going through. I know you know what is happening right now. I know you understand that the car in front of me is going 15 in a 25 mile hour zone. <laughs> and Lord, I'm just going to stop all this stress. And I'm just going to believe in you and trust in you. Now, that might be trivial to you, but maybe there's something really major in your life that you're going through. And you're just stressed out. And you're just wondering, oh God, what, what's going on? Oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. Ah, ah. Instead of just going, you know what, God? You know what I'm going through. And Lord, I'm just going to take some deep breaths and I'm just going to trust in you. I'm going to sit back in your peace and I'm going to rely on you to do what you need to do in me and in this situation. So point one, events of my life aren't random. Say that to yourself. Events of my life aren't random. Point two of our application. God's purpose for you is to be healed and free from the hurts that have constrained you. From the hurts that have constrained you. What I mean by that? Hurts that have constrained you. That have kept you bound. I've had hurts in my life. And I go through my life conformed to those hurts. And maybe it comes out in anger. Maybe it comes out in control. Maybe it comes out in different aspects of my life. But because of how I've been conformed in my life. I'm constrained. I'm bound. God's grace is there for you to heal you so that you no longer need to be bound by those things that have so conformed you. And He wants to have His Holy Spirit transform you. And so the third point is, in the application is, the crucible fire is God's hand in your life to transform you. It's, get, it's hot, man. The fire is hot. It's uncomfortable. I don't like what I'm going through. Okay, <laughs> I don't like what you're going through either. But rather than complaining about the situation, let's turn our eyes toward God and say, Okay, God, okay, God, what do you want to do in me? What are you trying to transform in me? So ask God, what do you want to do in me through this trial? What are you doing in me through all of this? Yeah. Yesterday we had our men's group. It was awesome. And I shared a, a little illustration about the octopus. And, you know, I got to say is that oftentimes as Christians, we're like octopus, octopus Christians. Not that we have eight legs, but we're experts in camouflage. You know, octopus, I, I did a lot of diving and spearing and octopus diving, taco diving. And, you know, it they call it the taco eye. You have to train your eye to be able to see the octopus in the water. Why? Because they're camouflage experts. They're highly intelligent. And, and everything I'm saying is related to you, by the way. It's related to me. Because we can be camouflage experts. Highly intelligent. We know, exactly how, know, we know exactly how to come in and out of church without communicating what's really going on in our life. Or being real. <laughs> we, go to, we can dress up, we can smell good, but we got all kinds of stink inside. And God wants to pull it out. Yeah. And so the taco is so smart that... When you're diving for taco, there's a couple of things you look for. One of them is that they have a hole. They live in a hole. Okay, in the reef, they live in a hole. Usually it's flat ground. And you're swimming along, and you're looking for these clean rocks. The clean rocks, they, they eat all the stuff that's on the outside of the rocks. Maybe there's some clam shells because they eat mollusks. And they, they have those shells and rocks all around the, the front of their hole. But they're highly intelligent, so... I've even seen one octopus that had built a structural wall, like a, like a lava rock wall, like this wall over here. They built a rock wall all the way around the, 
the front of their hole. I was like looking, I was going, wow, this thing is like incredibly intelligent. It's that architectural uh, octopus, you know, a perfect wall. And what they do is a lot of times they'll, they'll grab the rocks and they'll put them all over them to hide the front of the hole. So you can't see them. So you might see the hole, but there's rocks all over the hole. And so there they are hiding inside. And we do that. We do that. We got all kinds of stuff inside of us. God wants to deal in us. But hey, I'm just going to hide. I'm going to dress good. I'm going to smell good. I'm going to show up in church. Nobody knows what God is really doing in me. Nobody knows what's going on inside of here. I'm just going to hide. I'm going to be the octopus Christian. <laughs> and then God comes along and he comes with the pole spear. A pole spear has three prongs on it. It's called the three prong. He comes along and he starts kind of like tickling. He starts touching. Oh, when he touches, I get uncomfortable. Do any of you feel uncomfortable? When God starts to touch, He starts to pinpoint stuff in your life. And you're just struggling, you're fighting with it. It's uncomfortable. So here I come along and I got my pole spear and I start probing in the hole. I move the rocks away, move all that camouflage rocks, stuff that He's hiding behind. I start moving away. I put the, the prong in there. I start poking. I start playing with it. The taco starts getting uncomfortable. He turns his stomach toward me, I'm poking, I'm not spearing it, I'm just poking it, I'm agitating, I'm aggravating it. But I'm making him feel extremely uncomfortable. <coughs> and eventually what he does, he says, man, I gotta get out of here. So when he comes out of the hole, that's the final submission, he submits. Comes out of the hole and I grab him with my hand. I'm not spearing, I just grab it with my hand. Now think about you and what God is doing in your life. Think about us. God's got us in some situation. We're camouflaged in there. We don't want to let anybody know what's really going on in our life. We just, you know, I'll go in and out of church. You know, nobody really knows. And God's going, hey, I know. So he starts pinpointing. Oh, ooh, oh, ooh, you know, pokey. Oh, God, why you got to do that? And it's uncomfortable. And until we submit into his hand, the probing will continue. Until God is able to actually deal. Because you're a diamond in the rough, right? But he's got you in the crucible for purpose. The hardships are for purpose. And that is to cause you to be transformed into the image and likeness of his son. So let's look at how this process can actually take place in our life. The process of transformation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. And by the way, this command is to change the way you deal with your hardships. Don't stay the same. Don't stay the same. Let God deal with you. Verse 13. Therefore, there's five things in this passage, by There's five things that we're going to look at. I have them underlined. In your notes, they're underlined. I believe they're underlined. Yes. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. That's before you came to Christ. But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God says that. So my observation of this passage is that this is a call to action. To no longer do things the way you've been doing them. It's a call to action. The five things he says to do, they're underlined. Preparing your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance and be holy in your conduct. Be holy even as He is holy. So I want to ask you, are, are you really seeing things as they really are in your life? Are you? Is the way you see and interpret things influenced by how you've been conformed to this life? 
Am I looking through the eyes of what God's greater purpose for me is in this hardship? Hardship with family, relationships, interpersonal, what health, whatever it is. Am I really looking at the bigger picture? As he reminds us, don't be conformed to the way I used to live, but be transformed. God says, don't remain in your ignorance. Now you know light and darkness. You know what is right and you know what is wrong. Don't remain in the darkness. So my application for this call to action is be transformed by His Spirit so that my conduct will fit my identity. Be transformed. You know, I think about, you know, one of the words that comes to me when I think about, um, it says in one translation, girding up your minds for action. Be sober. Now when we think about be sober, we think, oh, well, don't drink too much. You know, be sober. But the idea is this. There needs to be a, something that takes place up in here between the two ears, right? Yeah. Gird your minds for action. In other words, just don't go along your day like you've always been going and living your life like you've always been going and having the same tr troubles and trials and and th the things that you go through day in and day out and you're responding exactly the same way you've been doing for the last 40 years, 50 years, 20 years, whatever. And you just, it's another lap around Mount Sinai. God wants to change what's going on in here. Okay, so getting the bigger picture is going, okay, God, what are you, what is, what are you doing in this? And am I looking at this the way you want me to look at it? Or am I just conformed to the way I always do things? And maybe that's why I'm having such a hard time with it. Because rather than letting you transform my mind in the way I think about things, I'm just locked in to this way of looking at it. And I call it stinking thinking. How many have ever heard that terminology before? Stinking thinking. We can have all kinds of stinking thinking. Stinking thinking about who we are. Stinking thinking about other people. Stinking thinking about different ethnicities. Stinking thinking about our jobs, think, stinking thinking, thinking about our lives, stinking thinking about everything. We just walk around with all these stinking thinking. When all the time God wants to change our stinking thinking to begin to see the bigger picture and how He sees things. Having the mind of Christ. And so you'll, you'll be amazed that the way you think oftentimes about yourself and others is the way you will live. All right? That's going to affect your life. Big time. It will affect your life. It will affect how you relate to people. It will affect you on the job. It will affect you how you deal with your children, your spouse. How, how, when you lay your head on the bed at night, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Is that stinking thinking that is you have been conformed either by your family, an, uh, something that's happened to you in life, broken trust, whatever it is, that it affects you in such a capacity that now you have a problem trusting God. Be transformed by His Spirit so that my conduct will fit my identity. Now the second application is God's purpose is not for you to be overwhelmed by your challenges but to experience more of his grace love and presence in the midst of it God has a purpose for all that you've been through and all that you're going through it's not, and it's not His purpose for you to be overwhelmed by your challenges, but to experience more of His grace, His love, and His presence in the midst of it. Your life is not just a random series of events. They're for purpose. Will you make a decision this day and every day following? To get rid of the stinking thinking that has kept you bound for so many years? We all have our challenges. We all have our, the things that 
seem to entrap us. But, but God is saying this day, and He wants us to get on board with Him, that no longer will you allow that stinking thinking to govern and to guide your life. But you got to gird your mind for action. You got to be sober. You got to see things clearly as they are, the bigger picture. Guarding your mind for action is when that thought comes into your, into your mind, you're not just going to just take it and run with it, because that's what you've been doing for the last 40, 50, 20 years, whatever. You've been running with that stinking thinking. God says, I want you to gird your mind for action. And when those thoughts come in, you're going to combat those thoughts and say, no more in the name of Jesus. I'm no longer going to think about that person the way I have in the past. We were sharing this yesterday at the men's group. I said, you know, I go to church and, you know, you know, we get these ideas about people. Oh, they don't like me. And I was sharing a, an experience from my youth when I was a part of this youth group. The pastor was a, a former world champion surfer of the youth group. And, and I was sitting in his office one day. I think I was about 15 or 16. And this guy comes in the office of the church. I mean, in, in his office, the youth pastor's office. And he doesn't say hi to me or anything. He talks to the youth pastor. He walks out of there. And then when he leaves, I go, that guy doesn't like me. And then, the, and then the youth pastor, his name was Brad McCall. He looks at me and he goes, have you ever talked to him? I go, no. <laughs> what I said was that, he don't like me. He never says anything to me. He never says hi. He never talks to me. And then he asked me, well, did you ever talk to him? No. And then, he, then the light came on and the pastor goes, maybe he feels the same way about you that you feel about him. So here I am walking around with stinking thinking. Okay, that guy don't like me. I don't know what's, a, what's his problem, you know. He look at me sideways, you know. So I said, okay, all right, okay, I'm going to say hi. So the next time I saw him, I said hi to him. And he just turned around and walked away. <laughs> so then I knew he didn't like me. <laughs> but let me tell you is that in church, sometimes we have that. You know, it's like we got stinking thinking. We go to church, we're judgmental. We're looking at other people. We don't like them. We, don't, we like them. You know, and people look at us funny and we're thinking, those guys don't like me, whatever. God is saying... Get over yourself. Remember what the, the people that wrote the Bible, they, they weren't writing it for themselves. They were writing it for you. Get over yourself. This is not all about you. Think about them. I want you to walk and live in a way that you're thinking about them. What's the best for them? What can you do for them? And so allowing God to transform us and realize it's not all about you. Trusting God in the midst of it all can be our greatest challenge. God is faithful and worthy of our trust. Is God not worthy of your trust? Like the video, I love that video. It's, it's so hilarious because we can trust God to a certain point, but when God tells us to do something hard, hey, I can't do that. That can't be God. We're running out the door. Hey, wait, that can't be God. That's too hard. When all along, God's going, that's the very thing that I want to deal with you in. Remember the rich young ruler? That's what it was taken from. Go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. God, you know, Jesus didn't like beat around the bush. He had his finger right on the spot, the thing that was keeping that person from following him. And so I just, I want you to, Everybody, just to think right now, think it not strange. Whatever the trial or the ordeal you're going through, think it not strange, this fiery ordeal that you're going through in your life right now. Look to heaven, look to God, and say, God, what is it that you are trying to do in me? What is it that you're trying to change in me? Is it the way I think? Is it a character issue? Is it some, you know, is it anger? Is it resentment? Is it bitterness? Is it unforgiveness? You know, one of the hardest things to do is to go, somebody who's hurt you and offended you, is to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. 
Forgiveness for what? They're the one that offended you. Forgiveness that I held resentment against you. Forgiveness for anything that I ever done to you that would hurt you. How many of you that's easy to do? No, we are the opposite. I'm conformed to this world. <laughs> it's like eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Right? It's funny when you grow up as a kid, you know, I had a sibling brother and we'd start playing around and fooling around and you know, I'd punch him, you know, he'd punch me and then wait. You punched me harder than I punched you. So, boom, a little bit harder. And then, wait, you punched me harder than I punched you. Boom. Next thing you know, furniture is breaking. You know, it's just out of hand. And so, God is dealing with us on how to respond. Girding your minds for action. Be sober. Get the big picture. See things clearly. Don't be conformed to your former passions and ignorance. Things that you did before, behaviors, actions, attitudes. That was the way you were conformed to this world. But God is saying, no more. I want to conform you, transform you to my image and likeness. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you stand with me at this time? I have this prayer, but you can, you know, you can read the prayer. It should be on your notes right here. This is a prayer of declaration as well as petition, okay? It's a prayer of declaration. And God the Holy Spirit has us right here where we are right now for the purpose of transformation. So if God's putting His finger on an area of your life, it's for purpose. If you're going through a hard time in your life, it's for purpose. You can, you can grumble and complain. You can kick and scratch and fight like a spoiled child. Or you can say, okay, God, all right, what is it that you want to do in me? Is it a little bit more of humility? Is it a little bit more of transparency? Is it a little bit more of patience and love, endurance? What is the stinking thinking you want to extract from my mind and put your thoughts in my mind in its place? No longer will I be constrained and bound by these things that have bound me for so long. And so let's pray this prayer, and I just pray that God would, you know, what, whatever, the spray, the, the buckshot, the pellets going everywhere of the Holy Spirit, wherever God pinpointed in you, whatever He pinpointed in you this morning, would be brought to Him with a humble heart and saying, okay, God, I'm ready to be changed. I'm ready to be transformed. I'm ready to trust completely in you. So let's pray this prayer. Gracious Yeshua, thank you that you are redeeming every disappointment and hurt of my life for your greater glory. I see now that the suffering of the present is nothing to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in me. I am being transformed by the renewing of my mind to the washing of the word. You are truly at work in me to will and to do of your good pleasure. I know that all things that are transpiring in my life and have transpired are working together for good on my behalf. Thank you for being faithful even when I'm faithless. All glory and honor to you, my King and my God. Love you, Father. Love you, Yeshua. Love you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you, Pastor Rod. Thank you, everybody. Facebook, online, love you. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, oh. Aloha, Facebook, Ohana. So, oh, you turned it off already? Oh, oh, my wife still kept you on. All right. <laughs> but discuss uh, a yeah, point with your family, just what touched your heart. And, and if you need any prayer or anything, just get a hold of myself, one of our leaders. Love you guys. Signing off because we're going to talk story a little bit. <laughs>